Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tech Educator Podcast. This is episode number 123. Today, we're going to be talking all about efficient ways of being a Gmail and Google Calendar power user. We have a lot of great things to talk about today. First, I want to bring on our co-host today, Mr. Sam Patterson. Sam, how are you? Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jeff. I'm doing great out here in sunny California. You are doing some amazing things out in sunny California. I saw you working with robots recently. What's new in the world of STEM and robotics? Well, we've got a lot of exciting stuff going on. And what I'm most excited about is tomorrow I get to work with teachers on how to use the Sphero robot in STEM projects for K2 students. That is pretty cool. Is that an easy thing to do and, and get students interested in that stuff? Because I know a lot of teachers might be a little nervous about giving expensive toys to, to younger kids. Right. That's uh, one of the things I like about the Spiros is they're all kind of self-enclosed and they're really nice about replacing the ones I break. So they're a pretty good match for that. And in the world of science, you figure out an interesting terrain and you turn the kids loose with a robot to learn about that terrain. So it might be ramps or different surfaces or slick versus rough surface. It could be really any number of things, but the robot, you get it to always do the same thing and you get it to run into different things and see what that does. Now with the Spheros, are you worried about the first order coming in and attacking any of your kids? Um, no, that's why we don't use the BB-8s, Jeff. I understand. I understand. I understand. And it is important that we choose the right technologies for our kids. And speaking of that, Jen, you're doing some pretty awesome things out in Massachusetts. How are you today? Well, I'm great. It's a little rainy here in Massachusetts, but otherwise looking forward to working with some fourth graders tomorrow. I'm actually... Sam, you'll be happy to hear I'm working with Scratch with those kids doing... Oh, uh, the kids will be writing their own word problem game. And so they're gonna do some math integration and then they'll be able to go around to each of their peers and see if they can answer their word problem correctly. That is pretty neat. Is this the first time you're working with them on this or is this like a reoccurring uh, opportunity for them? Uh, this is the third time I'm meeting with the, all the fourth grade classes on Scratch. The first couple of times they were associated with a science class, I was using Makey Makeys and helping the kids to see how they could demonstrate that they could build a complete circuit by writing a simple program and making it you know, work through creating the Makey Makey circuit. That is pretty darn cool. Um, Sam, you recently were working on some of the things that you're doing at ISTE. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the fun stuff that you have going on? Because we are going to be doing our, our Salute to ISTE show coming up here in only a few weeks. ISTE at this point is, what, three weeks away, two weeks away? It's coming right, up quickly. It's coming up on us like, you know... Um, death or something else that looms that's uh, not so negatively connotated. Right. Um, I'm super excited, despite my metaphors, about ISTE because it's going to give me an opportunity to talk to more people about programming in the primary grades. I've got a presentation on that, and I'm doing a session with Nathan Stevens on uh, Tickle and Sphero. It's a poster session, which means we're going to take over a hallway with robots and be a real traffic menace. I am looking forward to doing all that stuff with you. I think I'm going to be spending a lot of time learning about STEM and robots and, and all that great stuff. I also know that on Wednesday they have a pretty cool Q. Uh, is it, is, is it a Q session? Is it a Q uh, workshop? There's something wonderful going on Wednesday afternoon. I was talking to John Carippo about that. And, yes, that's um, the Q steampunk session where teachers can come and get hands-on experience with a lot of the technologies that we're excited about now, whether it's Makey Makey or Scratch or the Sphero robots or Wonder Workshop. There's Q is basically put together. They're they're essentially you know recasting what we do in conferences, just like we're all spending all of our time recasting what we do in classrooms. So that instead of sitting and listening and learning about something, you can actually get your hands on it, play with it, figure out what it does, and begin planning. I think it's a great thing. If you are going out there to ISTE, certainly check it out. There's a lot of great things happening 
in the Denver area that aren't necessarily ISTE, but they're kind of ISTE related. Um, so absolutely check that out. And Sam, I, maybe we can talk a little bit more about Q here just for a second. We released today on TeacherCast a brand new uh, top 10 list, top 10 reasons to attend a Q Rockstar uh, camp this week or this summer. Sam, what is a Q Rockstar camp? The Q Rockstar camps are professional development camps for teachers. They're generally three-day camps that have two-hour sessions in the morning and the afternoon with a long lunch in between. And this allows teachers time to get <clears throat> their hands on with these technologies, to talk to teachers who are doing exciting stuff, learn about what they're doing, and start doing it themselves. Um, I've been working with Q Rockstar camps for three years now and have had an amazing time sharing puppets and programming with teachers and other teachers learn about you know amazing stuff to do with google slides with youtube basically these are like amazing teachers bring their best tricks and tell you how to do them you can of course check out that top 10 list and all the other top 10 lists over on teachercast.net we are having some pretty cool things and sam just one more quick plug i understand that there's a brand new programming podcast happening over on the teacher cast educational broadcasting network tell us a little bit about some of the stuff that you're doing with podcasting these days well beyond the hour of code is the new podcast that is housed in teacher cast and it's also available on beyond the hour of code.com forward slash itunes and this is a super exciting podcast about programming and how to use it in the classroom and it started with a lot of the topics i cover in the book focusing on the k2 or k, k through 6 classroom and now it's going to be expanding beyond that talking to people who are designing programming apps talking to teachers who are out there doing exciting stuff it's really meant to be kind of an ongoing conversation about awesome stuff that we can all do together in our classes very, very cool. So let's talk a little bit about our main focus for today. We're talking about being efficient in the classroom. And one of the things to, about being efficient is communication and keeping yourself on track. So today we're going to be talking all about Gmail and Google Calendar. And these really are two dynamic and powerful apps that when put together and used correctly can really save you time, help you out. And we're also going to start to talk today about how these two apps are used with other apps. I certainly want to get into ways that these are used with Google Classroom and how we can use Google Sheets and Google Slides and everything can be revolved around these two pieces of efficient hardware here. So let's just kind of start with Jen. And uh, Jen, when you're looking at Gmail and when you're looking at Google Calendar, do you see these as two things? Do you see these as kind of A and B under one big, huge umbrella? Um, talk to me a little bit about how, how you work with teachers when it comes to Gmail and Calendar. So it was interesting. We were talking about this right before the show started. And um, I think that although it's not my primary focus to educate teachers about mail and calendar, because my passion and focus in my role is to work with students, um, as educators, we can get really overwhelmed with all of the day-to-day -day tasks, you know, things that are demanding our time. And those things take away from the time that we can spend directly with kids and planning really powerful learning experiences for kids. So when I look at things like Gmail and Calendar and I, and I talk to teachers, on the one hand, they feel like they know how to use these things. But then when we have a longer discussion, I find that they're missing out on some of the features that provide for um, big gains in efficiency that can really save them some time and allow them to turn around, um, you know, lose that time sink so that they can invest it with kids. So I think, like you said, they're, they're separate, but together because they're under that Google Apps umbrella. And I've even recently been using Google Keep. I, mean, mm. I know we talked about that recently on the show yeah. um, because they just all really you know, integrate very well together. So you can make an event from, a camp, from an email, as uh, many people may be aware. Um, you can you know, put things into calendar from Google Keep. And so these things can be really... Um, you know, they work very dynamically together and, and the, because of the fact that they're under that Google Apps umbrella. You know, I always say that we use, you know, well, I don't say this, but, you know, it's, it's been said that we only use like 10% of our brain, right? And I always look at Gmail and say, we really only get a chance to use 10% of it. I mean, yes, on the surface, it's an email program. You send, you receive, it's great. But there's so many things you can do with it that, you know, Email is really just a small bit. And I, of course, I want to get into 
the whole world of working with attachments. I mean, I see a lot of times people are taking a Google Doc or a sheet and they're downloading it into their desktop and then they're opening up their email and then they're sending it as an attachment. And you can do all that with like one click. So we're going to do a lot of uh, back and forth here. We've got a lot of screen shares and screenshots and stuff. And we're really going to talk about ways to be a Google Power user. Jen, um, while we start this thing, why don't you switch over to screen share? Because I want to ask you to kind of give us a tour of maybe just some of the basic features of Gmail. And then we'll kind of start and go into it. Sam, you're a Gmail user, aren't you? I am a Gmail user. There is no denying it. And I got into the Gmail back when I was a kid. It was free, and now I can't kick it. And are you making use of all of the Gmail filters and labels, or are you just one of those people that takes an email and get gets rid of it? I have a very fluid and natural relationship with labels and filters in my Gmail. And there are times in my life when I use a lot of labels and other times in my life where I ignore them completely. Hmm. And sometimes when I look back on my labels, I can see things like interpersonal busybody. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> that says a lot about that time in my life. Well, I want you to, while, while we're working with Jen, I'm going to invite you to to give us some of your Gmail power trips. I know, was it a year, maybe a year and a half ago, you were talking to us about ways to extend your email address and how to manipulate it a little bit. Do you remember what that was? Oh, yeah. That's, that's just, just cheap charlatan social media wizardry where if you have an email address like Sam is great at gmail.com, not my address, though I wish it were. Um, and you take a dot and you put it after Sam, Sam dot is great at gmail.com. Then everything in the world will think that is a different address than Sam is great at gmail.com, but Gmail will not. So it will still deliver your mail to you. Um, so if, for example, you're trying to create a large number of puppet twitter accounts for example hypothetically you could manipulate your own email address so you didn't have to spawn like eight hundred thousand gmails now the nice thing about gmail is you can always spawn off another one they just occasionally ask you to verify via phone and sometimes everything gets very confusing so you can just move the dot around so for instance if you wanted to set up sam dot Waka Patui at Gmail. Technically, that's the same account, same email address. Is that is that what you're saying? As Sam Waka dot Patui at yes. Because I heard a trick today. Maybe Jen can chop in here. But um, where if you subscribe to a lot of newsletters, you could do Sam plus Walmart at Gmail, and you could do Sam plus Sears at Gmail, and that's all the same thing. That way you kind of have an idea of where these emails and stuff are going. A am I on the right track about that one, Jen? Do you know? Yeah. Um, actually, before or even now, when teachers are creating, sometimes students need access via email to certain web tools. It's um, a, a trick that a lot of times teachers will employ to create student accounts that uh, so example, I could say Judkins J plus student one at Linfield and, and put my address in and all those emails would come into my inbox, not to a student. Mm -hmm. So it's a workaround for some people to meet the COPA compliance where kids are underage but need to register for a site. Or if kids don't have email access because sometimes schools don't issue email accounts to students and uh, but they may need it. I think Sam, you know, that that trick that Sam's talking about is really helpful for being able to create filters later, which yeah. we can talk about um, so that when emails come in and they're coming in with a dot in the middle of your name, let's say, which is not the way you would normally spell your email, it still comes in and it still uh, works. You can, you know, get a verification email if you sign up for something. But if you don't want to receive any other emails um, and you want them to get moved into a you know a, a trash or or automatically archived or whatever you can set up filters that will will do that to any mail that's coming into that user got it wizardry. It's the same one. it is wizardry yeah. jen Very give us clever. i see you're all set up here jen why don't you give us a little um tour if you will of some of the basic gmail functions 
Sure. So my Gmail might look a little bit different than some people because I have, for example, my chat, my Google Hangouts chat on the right hand side. That is a Gmail lab that I have in place just to help clean up that left hand side, which can get really messy and crowded. Um, so, you know, on the left hand side, you have your your different um, sections of your inbox. You have the that's where your folders would be located if you created uh, labels, they call them. Um, and then underneath that, I have a Google Calendar that's built into my mailbox. That also is a Gmail lab that I like because I um, always have my email open, but then I don't also have to have my calendar open to see any upcoming events on the, the day that I'm looking at. So, and then of course you have the, the center area where your mail comes in. I have a tabbed inbox view. So mine is set up so that instead of one continuous stream of email, I have set it up so that I, uh, they call it, I think a priority inbox um, set up so that so that I have separated my social emails that come in, like all of the Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus notifications fall under social. And then promotions, those are things from different companies. So it's a way for me to kind of move over automatically. Google does this for me. It filters out emails um, and puts them under these categories so that my primary inbox is um, already Kind of getting rid of some of those things that might distract me during the day that i that i really don't need to look at immediately and you can very simply change the filtering rules on there i think all you need to do is really take one of those emails and shift it onto let's say promotions and it says do you want to do this for all emails like this it's it's, exactly. it's really really neat yes yeah because um i've actually never had it do the wrong thing but that doesn't mean that i might not want a different rule as you said so maybe um you know the the emails from best buy that give me coupons are things that fall under promotions but i want to see those so right right i was gonna say joanne fabrics but i i feel <laughs> what you're saying now the only thing you can't do is rename those filters i mean i would love to see them be able to instead of saying social and promotions maybe say third grade fourth grade and have you automatically filter back in there but but there's other ways that you can filter an email say by a grade level or by a uh, particular person department talk to us a little bit about labeling and filters so yeah so um a lot of people that especially if you come from kind of the outlook world you're very accustomed to putting mail into folders that's something that people get very attached to and and like the idea of say organizing all parent emails under a folder or emails from a certain person. Um, so you can on any given email, you can add a, a label. So a label is essentially, a, I consider it very similar to a folder. The only difference is that with a label, the nice thing is you can have multiple labels on the same item, whereas with folders, in the classic, you know, mail environment, you could only put something into one folder. So um, having labels, they function like tags um, where you can, you, you define what the label is. So you could have a label that is parents and, um, you know, IEPs or something where maybe it's a, you know, it's a parent email, but it's related to a special education plan. And that way you can look it up under either of those labels afterwards. So Labels can be added both manually as email comes in uh, and of course labels, you, you can make as many as you want. It's not, there's no limit, um, but you can also set them up so that as email comes in, it looks for certain criteria that you set. Um, maybe all messages from a particular person or messages that have a certain subject and automatically apply those keywords, those, those labels so that when you're done reading the message, if you decided to archive it, make it leave your inbox, but want to be able to look at it again later, it would be under that category, that label, um, without you having to, to perform an, an action to it again. Like, because a lot of times, you know, okay, every email from this person, I want a specific label attached to it. Or labels. Or labels, yeah. And I, it's funny, like Sam said, he has kind of, you know, sometimes he uses and sometimes he doesn't. I, I almost never use labels. I, I use them occasionally, but um, 
I, I always tell people, remember when you're using Google products that Google was first and foremost a search company and they do search really well. So um, with email, it's the same thing. The search uh, bar, which is up the top, is really powerful. So you can, um, you can type in words and do searches that way. But you can also, there's a little drop down arrow that appears that many people just don't even notice. It's just to the left of that, that magnifying search button. And when you open that, it actually provides you with a great interface where you can uh, indicate who mail is coming from, who it's coming into, um, what the subject might contain, any of the words that might be in the email, as well as uh, one of my favorite things is whether it has an attachment and how many days that, uh, that you might have received it. Um, so I find the search to be so powerful that it actually is quicker for me to do a search than it is for me to try to look through those different folders that are created other, as the result of these labels. And I think that's so important, and, and, and I'm going to just back up what you said because I say this constantly. Google, by the way, is a search company. And, and knowing how that advanced search bar works and, and most importantly, when you put something in there, how it actually reads. You know, if you you don't even have to use that. You can just do type colon documents, for instance, like in Google Drive, and it'll find and filter all of those different things. And this really comes back to two basic fundamentals. And Jen, I'm going to turn on my um, screen share here just for a moment and show off there it is that there's really two ways of looking at this if i s check off an email here and jen maybe you can comment there's a delete button and then there's an archive button jen what is the difference between the delete button and the archive button oh it's a very big difference and i think something that uh, a lot of people are not aware of so delete obviously removes mail and puts it into your trash where it will remain for a period of time or you can permanently delete it. But, but essentially you're, you're getting rid of that message. You don't plan on ever needing it again. Um, archive is different. Archive is putting your email almost in a standby mode. It's removing it from your inbox. So you're not having to look at it. It doesn't feel like you have lots of email, which I, I really hate the idea of my inbox being full of lots of mail. I just, it feels like work to me, <laughs> even if I've already read them, I just don't even like to see them anymore. Um, but archiving puts them in under the category of all mail, which means that if you do conduct a search, like we just talked about, any messages that have been archived will pull up in that search. Trashed messages, messages that you delete will not be found in a search. Um, the, the thing is that many people have come from, again, sort of more of a classic email environment where they were very limited on how much, um, mail could be kept. And so people are accustomed to deleting messages because their inboxes would get full and then they would not be able to send and receive mail. But in Google apps environments, you do not have this limit. And so there's really no need to delete email. But then again, you don't want to keep looking at it. So I, I always try to tell people, you really need to have a rule of thumb that you open email one time and you make a decision about it so that you're not opening the same email again and again because you're wondering, gee, why is it still in my inbox? Do I need to do anything? That's just really inefficient. So as much as possible for people to open a piece of email, make a decision whether it's reply or whatnot, and then and then archive it immediately. So let's take a look at some of these Gmail settings. First of all, the difference between Gmail and many of the other apps is you need to hit the save button with every single change. And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we hit calendar. But let me uh, zoom in a couple things here. Maybe, Jen, we can tag team on this. I'm going to click on a message. You can see here that it has a new label, but I'm going to then update that. I'm going to put another label on here, and we'll just name this tech educator. I'm going to create this as a new label. I'm going to create it here. Notice now it has two labels. Now, Jen, explain this to me because this is not in a folder, but it is in a folder, right? Like, so here we have a new folder, sorry, a new label. Got to remember that called tech educator, but this 
email is still in the inbox. So do I need to slide this into the tech educator label to get rid of it? Can I hit the delete button and it'll still be there? Do I hit the archive button? What do I need to do now that it's properly labeled to get it out of my inbox? So that's where that archive button comes in. So when archived, when mail is archived, it's gone from your inbox. So you're not looking at it, but it's kept under the label. If you don't apply a label, it's actually still there. It's under your all mail, which you might not see immediately. You have to mouse over the more button, uh, the more area, and that will expand as you're showing, Jeff, uh, that expands the other things that are that are there listed and all mail is where that those messages are that's all of the mail that you've ever sent or received that you've archived so we have a, a a lot of people here in our live chat and kathy here asks the question is archive very much like read later it is not like read later um i actually used a specific tool for that when you archive something, the thing is that it, it, it actually uh, kind of disappears from your inbox. You're not seeing it. So if you mean to read it later, you wouldn't, re you know, you wouldn't know to do that. You have to have some sort of reminder to and, read it later. And let's talk about those reminders, right? Because there's a lot of things that you can do here. For instance, there's this star. And then there's also this little flag, which is being marked important. Jen, mm -hmm. do you use both of these? Do you use them interchangeably? Do they mean the same thing? They really mean, um, I mean, you can, you can change them and use them differently, but basically it's just another way to label an email and be able to sort by that thing. So if you mark it with a star, you can filter all of your starred emails. So you might decide, okay, for email that I want to read later, I'm going to archive it, but I'm going to put, I'm going to mark it with a, with a yellow star. For me, I actually use a tool that um, it's a, I, we were talking about this before the uh, show started today. I use something called Write Inbox. Hmm. And Write Inbox has both a paid and a free version. I, I think most people can get away with the free version. Um, it allows you to use it 10 times per month. And if you refer other people to it and they sign up, then you get, uh, I think, 10 additional credits each month. But what, what's powerful about it is, for example, one of the things that it does is it allows you to remind yourself later. So let's say I purchased tickets for a concert today and that concert is in two months. And what I got is the, um, you know, the, the tickets came into my inbox, my digital tickets and directions and all of that. So I would um, use that right inbox uh, feature that allows me to remind that email and have it come back to me at a specific day and time. So I'll have it come back to me um, like the day before the concert. So it's right there in my inbox ready for me. Um, instead of having it sit there for two months while I'm waiting for the concert. And, and you know, that that just kind of gets it off my plate and returns it when I need it. I like the there fact that there's other tools that do that too. That's not the only one. It's just the one I happen to use. I was going to say, I, I like the fact that there's a lot of apps now where if you swipe in one direction, it deletes it. But if you swipe in another direction, it schedules it for a later time. Um, yeah. I don't use that nearly half as much as I should, but I think it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. You know, the other thing about this and, and, you know, we talk a lot in, in our school cause we're making the transition from outlook over to Gmail. Um, couple things people always ask about. They always ask about the differences between folders and labels. And we talked that. And as you said earlier, you know, you can have an email that's in multiple labels. And again, the reason for that, and, and correct me here, is you really have two major folders, right? You have archives, which is everything, and then you have delete. And when you label something in the archives, that's when you see the labels, that's the way I'm. That's the way I, I always teach it. So you can be, you can have more than one label, but essentially, when you get it out of your inbox, it's in this big, huge, massive things because Google wants you to search for it. Now, if you're looking at your Gmail list, you can actually set this up based on how you think about things. So I'm going to come over here to the gearbox. I'm going to go into settings, and. If I click over here on inbox, I've got all these different inbox types. Now, Jen, there's a lot of um, 
features and and filter I, I don't want to use the word filters but there's a lot of different features and settings in here that you can use the one i like to do is unread first and now it's not just important to, to know how you can move that and you can change them every day but it says here i want the first thing to be unread and I want to show up to 25 items. I, I just want to keep that up. And then I want to do everything else. Or I can customize it so that way, let's say I do unread and then I want starred and then I want important and then I want everything else. So I can hit save on this. And then when it reloads itself, now you can see I have my unread first, I have my starred second, I have my important, and then I have everything else. So I know a lot of people are used to looking at their outlook and they filter things a certain way. And here you can do the same thing and have it set up for your needs. I also think it's awesome here that you can do the little you know, toggle triangles. And if you don't want to see 100 emails, you don't have to see 100 emails. How do you set things up or how do you recommend teachers setting things up? Well, I think it's a, a lot of it's personal preference. Um, I think for many people, if they did unread first, it would be difficult in the beginning because many people have, uh, when I work with teachers, I'll go in and they have thousands of email messages. I have, I never have more than 25 or so in my inbox. I try to keep ahead of it and archive everything. And but it wasn't always like that. So um, for me, I keep it under default, but you can you can use um, these different settings. As I mentioned, I like to do the category filtering. That helps me a lot because at least removes the things that I don't need to see all the time, you know, immediately respond to or, or look at. Um, the, like you said, there's a lot of different settings in this, in this gear area here, the under, you know, the different configuration settings. One of my favorite, Jeff, is under the general tab. So when you're in settings and you access that by hitting that gear icon in the top right hand corner of your mail, mm -hmm. un under general, um, there, there are a number of different settings that people should be taking a look at. One is how many messages you have per page. But also, um, I really like looking at, I, I like the conversation view. What does that mean? I, and some people don't like it. So this is why I pointed out. Um, so the conversation view is, is something that means that if I send you an email and you reply to me, then I see um, your email and your reply. If that email is sent out, maybe you and I um, are, are in a group conversation, a group email, and there's several people involved in that email. No matter who replies, those are all grouped together because it's under the same, you know, it started with a particular email and, and people are responding to that same email. So it groups them together. Now, Jen, is that done by subject or is that physically done by looking at whatever the serial number is on the tweet on, on the emails that we have? I mean, how do, do you know how that's done? I don't I, I never really thought about it. I I mean, it always seems to be connected to whatever an original message was. And so it, it keeps them together. So I, I don't think it's strictly by subject. There must be associated, like you said, with the sort of file code that's associated with the email. So like if you and I, are, speak if you and I are in a group set of emails and we're back and forth, that's a conversation. But then what happens if at one point in time, I choose to just email you personally, is that now still part of the same conversation thread? In addition I, to the fact that we're still in I think it a... is. I'm pretty sure it would be. I, I think that is what happens. That, that's been my experience, that when people reply all versus reply individually, it's all still part of that same initial email. Hmm. Are it, you, had you found something different, Jeff? I, 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 I don't know. I, I know in other email programs, it's all done by subject area. And then so you know sometimes we just change the subject of the email, but we're still having a conversation. And I've never really tried it in Google or I've never really tried noticing it, I would say, in Google. Because sometimes, you know, we could be on several different email conversations. And I do like to keep things a little separately because you never know. But it, it's an interesting thing. I don't know. Maybe we, we can pose that one to the trainers yeah, list or we'll, I we'll bring it up. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it in that much detail to figure out if, like you say, if you change the subject, what that would do. But I do know that for a lot of people, they're comfortable with getting them separate because um, if you come from an Outlook environment that they didn't have conversation view, the default in, a, in that environment is 
you, you know, I send an email, someone writes back, and that's the only one I get is the at the top of my inbox is the is the single email that that people are responding, you know, I, and they don't like seeing them all clumped together. So right. for some people, they want to be able to turn it off. Hmm. Um, the, right below that, Jeff, if you um, scroll your screen, because I don't have my screen share turned on, but um, the the send and archive, I have that turned on. So I, I have this button toggled that says show, send, and archive. And what that means is when I reply to people, to me, I'm usually done at that point. Like I've addressed the email. It's, you know, it's been dealt with. And I don't, I don't like having to send and then also separately hit the archive button. So there is a send and archive choice that appears at the bottom of my email messages if I have that turned on, then I can either send the email and leave the the other, you know, the email I'm replying to in my inbox, or I can hit the send and archive and it will simultaneously send my reply and archive the message that I'm replying to. Got it. So I like that feature. Now the next one here, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the time here, but stars, stars. I know most people only use the yellow star but you could use all of these but i'm pretty sure you can't filter by anything so really this is like a visual representation a visual right and, and right. you know you can use all the stars a couple of the stars unfortunately you can't filter i think i just said this you can't filter by it so you can't say third grade is the red star fourth grade is the purple star it's right. it's like an all or nothing thing but you do have these different options in here um chat is chat here's a question for you how come here we have my picture but then up here on the top right we also have a profile picture i couldn't figure this one out when i was working with my teachers what is the difference why would you need to have two different ones why can't we just have a profile picture well i think for some schools they that's something that can be set in the admin console that you have um i think you can prevent users from changing their profile picture that's associated with their Google apps accounts. But so maybe this is a separate, I have mine set to the same thing, but maybe some schools would have the profile pictures of the users set to like the school logo and then there, but allow users to change the picture in their email so that when messages come in inside the domain, they can see a picture. And that's something that that's an individual. I mean, can a, a central office or tech department autom automatically populate the student's school picture in their Gmail automatically? Do you know? I don't know the answer to that. That's um, a good one. I'll, ask, I'll see if... I'm uh, not sure. Sorry. Th that might be like an Eric Kurtz one. We'll see what happens yeah. there. But, <laughs> but, you know, we don't have time to go through every single one of these. But just to kind of hit the biggies, if you're using any kind of email program, get a signature, right? Like put, put a nice signature on here. I kind of wish that they had more than one signature options unless I'm missing something, right? Like you... It's just a signature. You can't do right. professional, like like with Outlook, we were telling teachers, have one for internal and have one for external. You know, so your external signature would be like, you know, from the desk of Mrs. Judkins, da, 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 da. And your internal one just says, thanks, love you, Jen. You know, basic yeah. things like that. Um, vacation re responders. This is powerful because this is actually one of the settings that shows up on the Gmail app for your phones. So if you set your vacation responder here in Gmail, you can also just automatically set it up like, you know, Friday when you're driving down the road outside of school, you can on your phone click your vacation responder to say, hey, I'll be back on Monday. Um, lots of other things just to c c catch in here. I want to kind of flip through all these really, really quickly and look at labs. Jen, you said that there's a few different Google labs that you use. Um, there, there's a lot, but there's not too many. Authentication icon for verified senders. I like this one because this actually shows you if it's a trustworthy person or you're getting spam from some random country in the world. Hmm. And so for me, it's it's just a visual reminder. I know that we already you know we talked about the the categories and the filters up on top, but this is just another neat one that I I like to have enabled here. Auto advanced. Do you use auto advanced? No, tell that's me what a neat that one. Does. Instead of hitting the delete button, let's say you're opening up an email, you hit the, you don't like it or whatever, you hit the trash can. By default, it takes you back to your inbox or your folder. Well, by going to auto advanced, 
if I delete an email, it automatically advances me to the next email. So that saves me a step. Nice. So that one I like to have. Um, custom keyboard shortcuts, that's kind of, you know, if, I, I always preach love your keyboard shortcuts. Google Calendar gadget. Now, Jen, I noticed that you have that set up. So that way all your Google Calendar stuff is on the left side of the screen. I yeah. think that's pretty cool. Google Maps previews in mail. Why not, right? Google Voice Player, I don't put that on. I do have a Google Voice for TeacherCast, but I don't, you know, we don't have it for school, so I don't put that on. Um, green Robots, it's a chat thing. I don't bother that. Mark is Red, I think, is important because that way you can still have it in your inbox, but it, it takes the red, you know, that Mark is Red off. Um, I don't know about this one, though. Do you know multiple inboxes? Mm -mm. Um, apparently, I'm just going to read it here. Adds extra list of emails in your inbox to see even more important email at once. I, I just haven't tried this one yet. I'm not sure if that's if you're collecting multiple, you know, sometimes we have forwarded emails into another inbox. I'm not sure how that one works. Um, Picasso kind of going away. Pictures and chat kind of going away. Preview pane. Jen, I, I have reasons to debate this one. Do you use preview pane or do you suggest preview pane? I don't use it, and but then I know people that love it. So I think, again, it's part of a... a preference some people like to have the preview pane because they don't want to have to actually launch their email they can just um they can you know again if you're from outlook world you might like this um the, it, to me this is very similar to an outlook interface where you could see the email without having to click on it in the same way you do with gmail so some people really like that so here's the issue with that and and, and most network directors and I've talked to many, don't like this feature because traditionally when you're working with email in, let's say, Outlook, the application, an email comes in and let's just say that it's a spam bad email. If mm -hmm. you have the preview pane open, sometimes some emails, all you have to do is click on the email to see the preview and that automatically generates the virus to go off or the spam to go off or something. So many people look at this and say, don't have the preview pane because then your email doesn't open. However, the other argument says, this is Gmail. It's cloud-based. Nothing's going to affect your computer because technically the email isn't downloaded on your machine. So it's not a bad thing to have. And I know it's, it's, it's a back and forth way of doing it. I don't have a specific answer for how to do this yet. I just know that a lot of secretaries like the preview pane and I know a lot of tech people and I've talked to a lot of different Google trainers about this. They say don't do that for the reason of what happens if it affects you. But it's it's Gmail. It, 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 right? It's 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 an online based only thing. Nothing is actually hitting your hard drive. Hmm. I I yeah, I I don't know. I I think that um, the important thing too for for users to know that are or folks that are listening is that labs are unique from other email options because these are not fully supported by Google. These are things that are, you know, developed by folks put out there for people to use, but they could easily disappear at any time. Um, but sometimes they graduate and. And maybe it's worth pointing out, Jeff, one of the graduated labs that now is a full feature of Gmail, fully supported feature of Gmail is undo send, one of my yes. favorite things. Uh, undo send is is actually now under, just as you have, Jeff, the general tab. It's right here. And it says uh, undo send, and there's a place where you check a box to enable undo send and you set a cancellation period. And this allows you to uh, hit send on an email, whether on purpose or by accident. I have had many a time where a cat has walked across the keyboard or I bumped something not knowing, I not meaning to send an email that was incomplete. Um, or more important, sometimes that you just need those, uh, that 10, 20 seconds of clarity that happens when you <laughs> hit the email send and you realize, oh no, I forgot to say this. Um, so what happens with undo send is that a little message appears at the top of your screen that says sending um, undo click here or something. And so that message will appear for as many seconds as you send the can set the cancellation period to. And then 
when if you wanted to retrieve the message before it sends, you can simply click on that message that appears at the top of the screen. And then, yep, just like that. Great. Thanks for sharing that on the screen. And when you hit undo, it simply pops you back into the editor. So it's not actually sending the email. What happens is with undo send, it's actually delaying the sending of your email for that number of seconds. So I tell people, if you set it for 30 seconds, which is the maximum time, and you're on the phone with someone and you say, well, I sent it. And they're saying, well, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. <laughs> it's because Very true. it's not actually sending for 30 seconds. And there's a lot of, and we're running out of time here, of course, but there's a lot of neat little tricks like that um, that you can certainly find in here. I, I just want to see if we can quickly hit a few, and then I want to go over to, to calendar here because, Jen, obviously we can do a lot of shows on this, and, and maybe we can do a series of, of you know these efficiency shows or these these basic shows. Um, we actually have some people here in the chat asking about, you know, is Gmail part of the Google Boot Camp experience? I certainly heck every, hope that every boot camp has Gmail. And, and it's got to be more than just, this is an email box. Thanks very much. There, I mean, all these little features here. And as, as we're pointing these things out, I'm seeing people in the chat going, oh my goodness, I've never seen that before. Because again, you only use 10% of Gmail sometimes. You don't right, realize right. these things here. I want to kind of zoom in on here. We're talking about you know third-party apps. One of my favorite third-party apps is called Reportive. Have you seen Reportive? No, let me hear about Reportive it. Reportive is a free, I, I, again, I, we, we can debate the word here. It's not a labs. It's not an add-on. It's not an, ex, it, it just kind of is. And it hooks into your Gmail and LinkedIn. Now, this is my trainer domain. So that's why a lot of these settings I say that I use, I, it, it's not showing up. But essentially, if I was to sign into my LinkedIn and I pull up an email to somebody or from somebody on the right side, it'll actually show the person's LinkedIn profile, their name, their email, their job description, all that good stuff. So that way, if I'm just getting a cold email from somebody and I don't know who this person is, it's right there on the side. Now, Gmail, if you look in settings, does have this feature in labs. I believe it was labs that I saw it. Um, uh, pictures and no somebody there there there, there is a, a feature on here I'm, I'm not seeing it at the moment here where you can put up like a little bit of information from the person because of course you're connecting into your google plus and you're all those different things but mm -hmm. nothing is going to be more powerful than all their linkedin information and i, I just find that interesting because then you can actually pull that into your contact list and i find that my contact list you know, I, I make a lot of contacts and meaningful contacts because I'm looking at them saying, oh, you're the PR agent for or you're the something. Um, Craig, Craig Yen is, is being wonderful and showing that Reportive is a Chrome extension. So oh, okay. so check check that out. I think that's absolutely one of the, the neatest things here. Um, chat labs offline. You're, we're, we should do a whole show sometime, Jen, on Google for offline. Because that is one of those things that you need to install. But, you know, there's so many things that are coming out right now for using your phone, not in a Wi-Fi situation. So check out all the offline features here. Another one of my favorite ones here, Jen, is themes. We could do another 45 minutes on, on just basic themes. I, I think for my teacher cast account, I put the kids on there. So all that stuff is pretty good. Speaking of which, they're knocking on the door. Um, labels. Very quickly, Jen. Could you give us the... the this is scary. I see show labels, I see hide labels, I see show if unread, and I know on TeacherCast, because I've hooked my TeacherCast up to phone, I see labels and then the word IMAP next to them. Could you give us the real quick, what are we looking at? How do we not make this scary for ourselves? So, you, oh, you're in the settings. I had to come flip over to see your screen, Jeff, to even see what you're talking about. So, um this is just in the label list um when you when you go to choose a label you can see those labels are available so i, I don't normally show if i have a label i show them all but i suppose that you might end up hiding some labels if perhaps you're automatically putting them as part of a filter jeff is that maybe how 
Well, why for, people would hide a label. So for instance, here under labels, I've got category social promotions. I can show or hide those. Oh, yeah. And so that's, I, of course, right. showing so up. I don't use like I, I don't use the forums label and mm -hmm. the updates label. Those are hidden for me. And then under labels, I've got, you know, the, the, the tech educator one that and it says show, hide or my favorite show if unread. So if I filter that everything that Sam sends to me comes to a Sam label, that label's not going to be seen unless there's an email in there. And essentially that's going to take the, everything on the left and just keep it as small as possible. Keep it as efficient as possible. OK, so there's there's a lot of things in here and the same thing. You know, you can come over here to filters and, and blocked addresses. And, and maybe, again, we'll just do a whole – I don't know if this is entertaining or not, but I'll, we'll just do a, a, a whole Gmail settings thing. There's a lot of stuff in here. Before we go, I do want to talk about these two toggles over here on the top left. We have contacts and we have tasks. Now, if you hit tasks, tasks brings up your task menu. Jen, do you use tasks in your daily life or do you have other ways of keeping track of yourself? Um, I've been using Google Keep for that sort of thing. I like Google Keep. And, and, and we'll talk about this in a couple of seconds here, but tasks real quickly. If I create a new task, I can say, we're going to start the tech ed show. When are we going to do that? I pick a due date. We'll do it on tomorrow, June 6. I'll throw some notes and that's as easy as it is. When I come over here to Google calendar and once it refreshes, now here's what I don't understand, Jen, under my calendars, I have a reminders. And then when I drop that down, it switches over to tasks. And you can see that the task is going to be over here once it updates and refreshes itself. What is the difference between tasks and reminders and why do we have them? So reminders are generated from things like um, my reminders are generated from Google Keep. So I can add a reminder in the Google Keep message and it will put it on there. Reminders also can come from things like... Um, I've noticed when I am posting announcements in Google Classroom, those show up as reminders in the Google Classroom calendar for students. So reminders are things that are, there's not a time associated with it. And it's not something that I need to mark as done. It's really just something that's sort of flagged for me. So I know, okay, today's the day that you, you know, have to remember to bring this into school or something. Whereas tasks are things that are, um, waiting for you to confirm that they're completed or not. Again, they show up at the top of the calendar appointment, but there's a box that appears next to them that you can check off and, and, and that will mark it off of if you do it in calendar, it will, or in the task list in Gmail, it will, it will cancel that from your calendar right? And from your task list and your calendar will cross it off. And that's the really important thing. I'm over here again. I'm in calendar. I see my tasks that automatically popped up here. If I check this off, it puts a strike through over here. It puts a strike through. And then in only a matter of seconds here, you'll notice that this task will automatically be struck through tasks. They say is more personal reminders could be personal or it could be a group again um if i'm running google keep with you and we have a shared google keep notebook jen and mm -hmm. i could create a reminder for both of us and then that would go into two different calendars and i, I i'm looking forward to doing the google keep show because there's a lot of awesome things especially i'm trying to work on right now google keep for administrators and secretaries there's a mm -hmm. lot of neat things that you can do with that there see there it goes it automatically uh crushed um, that task and put everything over. Mm -hmm. So where are we with all of this? I think that any educator, especially people that are working in the upper grades, needs to understand how to be an efficient educator, how to make sure that not only is their communication going back and forth, but how, you know, I look at email as a game. Get that email out of the inbox, right? Get it away as quickly as possible. I mean, there's so much stuff that we haven't even touched on. We, we barely use the word attachments. And so there's a lot of stuff here that we will certainly hit in future episodes. But Jen, what are your one or two tips that you give teachers to staying email efficient or achieving what we mytho mythologically call inbox zero? Yes. Uh, my big things that I try to encourage teachers to do as quickly as possible and as often as possible is to use that archive feature so that emails are not showing up in their inbox, but are available if they need to retrieve them. 
And also we didn't even talk about it, but setting up what are called filters and that allows you to um, search for certain kinds of emails or, or as they come in to look for certain characteristics of an email and then to create specific actions that happen to those emails. So for example, I get attendance daily from all the four different schools that I work in and I don't need to see that. I don't want it coming in my inbox, but yet if I'm in a room where I need to pull up the attendance, I don't want it unavailable to me. So I created a rule. I set up a filter whereby I, I said, okay, emails with the word attendance coming from these specific senders, you know, the building secretaries, I want to apply a label attendance. I want it to skip my inbox and I want it to archive it immediately. So I never see them, but they're available to me if I were to conduct a search in my mail. Um, and, and that just, that like cuts down on that email. Even I, I don't even have to see it or touch it and it's dealt with automatically because of the filtering. I think that there are so many things that we can do here to help teachers put themselves in the best place. Jen, as we go through the summertime, what types of things do you recommend teachers doing between June 30th and September 1st? Do you recommend archive everything? Do you recommend go through your labels and delete what you don't need, all those icky parents that you're never going to deal with again, get rid of them? Do we realize that there's no limit on Gmail? So just save everything. What, what do you recommend? So one of the easiest things that most people can do pretty safely is to actually archive all of their mail and then do a search on mail from the last say two weeks or month and then restore that mail to their inbox and then one at a time go the, go through those more recent messages. And, and that way they're getting to a point where they're, um, where they're kind of approaching that zero inbox or setting a goal for themselves. Like I said, for me, I, I try to never end the day with more than say 20, 25 emails in my inbox, which is a huge improvement for me. And the ones that are in there are there because maybe there's something that's pending that I need to respond to, or, or it's a longer email that I need to research something uh, for myself. So, so I, I'm always going to have some emails in there, but, um, but for many people, they can, especially at the end of the school year, archive everything and then retrieve by, by setting up a search, the emails within, that are dated within, say, two weeks or something. And then they can bring those back into the inbox and then individually address them, uh, you know, whether they want to keep them or not. Because most people have um, messages that are just way old that they don't need to see anymore. Um, that tabbed inbox feature by getting the promotional and social things out of the way immediately are very helpful. And we were talking about showing and hiding those labels. If there are labels that you won't need next year because they were for the 2015, 16 school year, then those, those labels could be hidden so that you're not even looking at them, right. but yet they're available. Should something come up that you need to retrieve an email? Absolutely. And, and, I don't want to say that there's unlimited labels because I think there is a limit, but really there's unlimited labels. Yeah. Uh, no, no one's going to be doing, I, I don't know if it's 3000 labels or five, but really I it's unlimited. I can't imagine anyone getting to that. And again, I, as, as someone that gets a lot of email, I really don't use labels for the most part. It's pretty rare. And that's because I find the search function to be so powerful and it's just faster for me. Do you find that you filter everything or have those filters set up? Even if it's just put a, a, you know, I know a lot of people, they still have the email go to their inbox, but they put a label on it first. So that way, at least it pops up. I do. I do use filters and, and part of the filtering that I do sometimes, it, as I said to you about things like the attendance emails, um, I skip the inbox on those. I don't even see them. I archive them immediately. But a lot of them, yes, they come in and I put a label on them. Things, so for example, from our superintendent or a building principal, I might want those to be labeled um, and or, or emails that come into a certain group, you know, that, that are messages to, you know, the high school staff. And I put those under a label for high school, for example. So um, I, you know, the nice thing about the the filtering rules is you can decide what you're comfortable with and, and you need to be careful not to 
archive things immediately and skip your inbox unless you're absolutely sure that you don't need to see them. So for many people, getting the label on there as it comes into the inbox and then being able to look at it, and make a decision if it's ready to be archived, knowing that that label is there is, is still a big time saver. So I was recently looking for resources for my teachers and I found this amazing resource called teching fo teaching teaching forward.net and if you go over to teaching forward.net there is some pretty cool training materials and when you drop down to google training resources there is an amazing one here on google calendar and jen i gotta tell you this is awesome this is fantastic this tells you exactly what it is and i love the logo by the way it it, it really is cool um but check out all the great stuff we will of course have links to all these things on our show notes again this is tech educator podcast 123 if you're looking for gmail calendar any of that stuff miss judkins is the one for you to go to she has some pretty awesome stuff and by the way new website coming right jen summer project jeff <laughs> <laughs> so definitely check all this stuff out. Um, I know for the last couple of weeks, Jen has been inspiring me to create these pretty, pretty um, sad, uh, neat. They're they're neat little cheat sheets. Uh, they're they're. I I'd be honest. I'm ripping off what you did because I like what you're doing, and I'm trying to make these up for my school. These are really yeah, really I, neat I though. It's great. But I think whenever we can put great resources out there, so that teachers uh, can can share with their peers and and have things available at their fingertips. I think it's fantastic. So, so I, I know teacher cast will be, will be popping some of these things out over the next couple of weeks, but uh, check out all this great stuff that's out there. Jen, where in the world can we find out more information about the amazing, amazing things that you're doing these days? So I have a website, as you mentioned, it's teaching forward.net and I can be found on Twitter at, at Jen J E N N Judkins J U D K I N S. Nice. And of course, you can check us out over on teachercast.net. Um, we are working on a lot of neat things for the summertime. Mostly, um, you know, we're going to be we're going to be basically revamping all these different Google apps. We are doing some pretty cool things to get ready for next school year and to help out teachers all over the place. Um, certainly, again, Sam had to back out today because he had a little network problem at school. But check out his books and his podcast over at beyondthehourofcode.com. And of course, his website, My Paperless Classroom, has put out a few different posts this week. You can find that over at mypaperlessclassroom.com. On behalf of everybody here on the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network, thank you so much for joining us every Sunday at seven o'clock. I'll see you soon at ISTE out in Denver. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Until next time, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions.